You guys want to fail these guys? We, we take a vote. Who would like to fail these people? Okay, so. Um, would anybody have objection to postponing the exam until Monday the 19th? Show of hands. Objection? That, that's good or bad? Then, then you shouldn't be showing your hands because I said show hands if, if that's a problem. Any problem? Problem? Okay. All right. So I'll change the schedule. We will make the exam on the 16th of April instead of the 19th. And that way, everybody will get an A. Right? Hopefully, I'd be happy. I'd be very happy if everybody got an A. Then I could say, wow, man, I'm a good teacher. I can teach everybody, right? Hear that? Or I made my exam too easy, one or the other. That's the other side of it. And you wouldn't mind that either, right? Win win. Okay. So we've got some business to do. And the business we have to do um, is moving now in the direction of proteins. So I hope you've gotten a feel for the relationship between pH and charge. That's a very important uh, concept. And we're going to see that pH and charge is going to come back as we talk about amino acids. Okay? So pH and charge, it's not going to go away. And we need to be able to understand how we can predict charge and so forth based on pH and pKa uh, of molecules. Okay? Now, if you have not worked through some of the problems, I will strongly encourage you to do so. And if you don't understand them, I want you to come and see me. All right? I am going to post my ways of solving some of those problems, because I've had some requests to do that. I've just been busy the past two days. I haven't had a chance to do it. But I will do that this weekend. And you can then uh, uh, see at least how my brain works, which is a little scary. OK? All right. But if you have problems and you don't understand them, the only way you can get help is either come see me, go see the TA, get a tutor, and I'm happy to do any, any of those for you. OK? All right. Well, uh, amino acids. We talk about amino acids as our first subject because amino acids, of course, are the building blocks of proteins. And proteins, I like to describe, I've already described them once in this class, as the working horses of the cell. The proteins do the work of the cell. If it means catalyzing a reaction, proteins catalyze reactions. You know, enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions. Proteins participate in signaling, communicating information. And no, you don't need to write this down. I'm just kind of going into this, you know. They participate in signaling, communicating information from outside the cell to inside the cell. That's very important because cells have to respond to the environment in which they find themselves. So they have to be able to pick up the signals, right? You probably have some people, some friends that you know that you would describe as clueless. And the reason you would describe them as clueless is because they don't pick up the signals, right? And I'm not just talking about answering their phone. I'm talking about, hello, this is pounding you in the head and you're not listening. If you're a cell and you're getting pounded in the head with proteins that are trying to tell you something and you're not listening, you're dead. OK? So signaling is important. We see proteins play very important roles structurally. They give uh, the structure to the cytoskeleton of cells. They give structure to out things outside of cells, like hair, like fingernails. Okay. So these things are very, very important. Uh, and so it's important that we start talking about amino acids. You'll notice it's entitled the 3D world of amino acids. And the 3D world of amino acids is literally that. We're not going to be doing things in 3D, but we will be doing some imagining of things in 3D because um, it's literally a 3D world in which all of these things are, are really uh, indeed happening. Well, if we look at amino acids, um, we see that amino acids can be written schematically in a very simple way. I said you would not have to draw structures, and you will not have to draw structures of amino acids other than a general amino acid. Okay? So the general structure of an amino acid is shown up here. Yes? You know, I was messing with that, and uh, the only way I can do it, I think, it's, it's very bright, I see, um, is I can dim the back ones. I can't seem to dim the front ones. Does that help? OK. I don't know what the deal is with it today, but the lights are just, uh, oh, this, finally it went off. OK. All right. Good. All right. So yeah. I tried that before. I didn't think it worked. But maybe I'm just not, I'm not patient enough is my problem. 
A lot of people tell me that. Slow down, Ahern. Get patient. Take it, take it easy. All right. I think you should know the general structure of an amino acid. I'm going to step you through it. We can schematically write the structure of essentially every amino acid as shown on the top. Okay? There are three very important atoms that are there, and they each have a name. The central one you see has, is a carbon, and it's called the alpha carbon. And the alpha carbon is the carbon to which all of the other groups of the amino acid are attached. Okay? So the alpha carbon is the carbon to which all of the other groups of the amino acid are attached. Two other groups of interest to us are shown beneath that alpha carbon. They include the alpha amino group. They also include the alpha carboxyl group. So there's three alphas there. The alpha carbon, the alpha carboxyl, and the alpha amino. The two above there, every amino acid has at least a hydrogen. And every amino acid has an R group attached to it. Now that R group, you remember from chemistry, can be almost anything. And that R group may itself include other amino groups or carboxyl groups. And that's why we call these the alpha amino and the alpha carboxyl, because the ones up here we call the R group amino or the R group carboxyl. Some amino acids have those, some do not. OK, now. Um, so I think you should know the general structure of an amino acid. There are 20 amino acids that we commonly find in proteins. About 10 of those amino acids are what we describe as essential. And an essential amino acid is an amino acid that must be in your diet. Your body cannot make it. Whereas about 10 of the amino acids your body can make, and they're not essential, at least not essential in your diet, but they're essential for you to be able to make proteins. Okay? Everybody with me there? All right. Now, I'd like you to look at that alpha amino and that alpha carboxyl for a moment. As you look at that, you see that the alpha amino has an NH3, and if you look very carefully right there, you see a little plus sign. That means that that little plus sign this amino group has absorbed a proton. And when it absorbs a plus charge, it gains a plus charge because it started out as an NH2 before it absorbed that proton. Okay. You'll notice that the carboxyl group has lost its proton, and it has a COO minus. When we go calculating charges on amino acids, and we will do that, when we go calculating charges on amino acids, we're going to need to know the possible charges that can exist on an amino group and the possible charges that can exist on a carboxyl group. And they're very simple, but students get careless and don't pay attention. So I want you to pay attention. An amino group can have two possible charges. If it has a proton on, it has a charge of plus one. If it loses that proton, it has a charge of zero. That's its two possible charges, either plus one or zero. At what pH relative to the pKa would it have a charge of zero? The amino group has a pKa. And what was the rule? If the pH was above the pKa, what happened to the proton? More than one unit. So if it's more than one unit above the pH, uh, above the pKa, I'm sorry, the proton is gone. So if the proton is gone, we have a charge of zero. Okay? If the pH is more than one unit below the pKa, the proton is on, and we have a charge of plus one. Make sense? Okay. Well, the rule I gave you last time was we said if the pH was more than one unit above the pKa, we would assume for the purpose of calculating charge that the proton was off, and if it's more than one unit below, the proton was on. In between, we could say, well, half on, half off, half of them have it on, half of them have it off, something like that. 
But if we're going to make estimates of charge, we have to say, well, it's on or it's off, and we have to make that decision. Okay? The carboxyl group has two possible charges. If the proton is on the carboxyl group, the charge is zero. Notice that's different. When the, char when the proton was on the amino group, the charge was plus one. If the proton is off of the carboxyl, the charge is minus one. And you can apply the same rule. If the pH is more than one unit below the pKa, what is the charge on the carboxyl group? What's that? Zero, because the proton is on. right? If it's more than one unit above the pKa, the proton is off, and its charge is minus one. Now, as we look at this guy, we discover that the, there's not just one pKa, but that the amino group has its own pKa, and the carboxyl group has its own pKa. All right? So just as an example, let's say that the carboxyl group, the alpha carboxyl group here, has a pKa of 2.2. Okay? And the alpha amino group has a pKa of 9. And that's not uncommon for either of those two groups. Give me a pH where the charge of this guy is equal, the overall charge is equal to zero. Anybody? What would it take for the charge to be zero? Either both of them are zero, right? Or one's minus and one's plus, right? Can anybody think of a pH at which both are charged zero? Okay, let's try six. If we say six, then what's the charge on the amino? The pKa was nine. So if the pH is more than one unit below the pKa, the proton is on. The charge on the amino would be plus one. Okay, what's the charge on the carboxyl? It's minus one, right? Because the pH is more than one unit above the pKa, which is 2.2, so the overall charge is zero. So the answer to my initial question is there's no pH at which both groups have a charge of zero. The only way we're going to have the overall charge of zero is if one is plus and one is minus. Make sense? I haven't convinced you of that one. The reason, how do I know that I can't have a pH where they're both equal to zero? Anybody have any idea? Why can't we have a pH where both are equal to zero? Well, let's try some examples. We can either have it very low, very much in the middle, or very high, right? That's three possibilities. We tried one in the middle, and when we got in the middle, what did we discover? We discovered that we had a charge of minus and a plus. So the middle isn't working. Let's try a very low. At very low, let's say I have a pH of 1. What's the charge on the carboxyl? Z no, it's 0. The pH is more than 1 unit below the pKa. The proton is on. When the proton is on a carboxyl, charge of 0. What's the charge on the amino group? Okay, apply the rule. pH more than one unit below the pKa, what happens to the proton? It's on. So if the proton is on the amino group, what's the charge? So what's the overall charge? Plus one, so we can't do it there, right? Let's go to pH 14. At pH 14, what's the charge on the carboxyl group? It's minus one, right? The pH is more than one unit above the pKa, proton is off. How about the amine group? Charge of zero, right? Because pH more than one unit above the pKa, proton off, charge of an amino when the proton is off is zero. Now, you should be able to do these in your head. You're going to, have, you're going to see a, most likely an exam, a problem on the exam is going to ask you to do exactly what I just told you to do right here. Now, if you get confused or whatever, again, you know who to see. The guy out standing out in the middle of the...